Well, thank you. Thank you, Nicholas, for the invitation, and good evening. Uh, when I was an undergraduate student, I did an Erasmus semester in a small town in Spain. When I got there, I was looking for a flat, I went uh, for a viewing, and there my future landlady was showing me around the flat a bit. When we got to the kitchen, she pointed at the microwave and said, this is a microwave. Do you know what a microwave is? I was a bit irritated by the question. I thought, do I look like I've just escaped from North Korea? Or, uh, but she then really went on to explain a microwave is a machine that you use to warm up food, you put a plate inside and so on. And, and I said to her, no, no, don't worry. I, I know how it works. And, and she said, ah, so they have microwaves where you come from. Oh, that, that's, that's interesting. Didn't know that. And um, why am I telling this? Well, because I sometimes feel reminded of my Spanish landlady when I hear people eulogize the NHS as if it were some kind of unique special achievement. Because in the same way in which she somehow seemed to believe that microwaves were uniquely Spanish, uh, some NHS admirers seem to think or have convinced themselves that the idea of universal healthcare is uniquely British, that you can't get this anywhere else in the world, that elsewhere people die in the streets if they can't afford uh, treatment. And this is why eulogies for the NHS can sometimes, or can actually very quickly, sound extremely parochial <coughs> and insular. So, for example, I, I, I read some of the, uh, the political speeches that were delivered around the 60th anniversary of the NHS, and there was one politician who said something like, Britain is one of the few countries in the world where the doctor will check your pulse before they check your credit card. And, and this is the kind of statement, if you said that in any other policy area, people would laugh at you, they would call you a little Englander, or, or worse, uh, but somehow in, in healthcare, this kind of uh, or parochialism seems appropriate. Now, I hate to be the one who spoils the party, but look, universal healthcare is not a very special achievement. It's nothing to be especially proud of. Apart from the United States, which is healthcare-wise an, an outlier for a number of reasons, Apart from the United States, every developed country in the world has achieved universal access to healthcare in one way or another. Okay? So there is a report on that by the OECD, it's called Health System Coverage, and it's probably the shortest report they've ever produced, simply because there isn't much to say about this subject. It's a, a problem that has been solved, that's been taken care of virtually everywhere in, in the developed world, so there is not <coughs> much to say. And there's one table in that report which uh, is the most boring statistic you'll ever see, because it says percentage of the population with access to a comprehensive set of healthcare services, something like that. And it then goes in alphabetical order. Australia, 100%. Austria, 100%. Uh, 100, 100, 100, at some point comes the United States, 85%, then again 100, 100, 100. So it's, it's, it's just that uh, universality is something that you can achieve within virtually any type of healthcare system. It doesn't matter what model of healthcare provision you have. You can achieve universality in any system if the political will is there. So, for example, in, uh, in social health insurance systems, kind of systems you get in Switzerland or the Netherlands, the way they achieve universality is through demand-side subsidies. That means if you don't have the money to pay for health insurance, then the government pays your insurance premium for you. That's it. Problem solved. So, if universality is your main objective, then you have absolutely no reason to prefer the NHS model to any other type of model. That can really be done in any, uh, in any kind of system. And most systems have achieved that without the government takeover of the healthcare sector as a whole, without nationalizing the provision of it. So if you want universality, demand-side subsidies are fully sufficient. You don't have to have 
state-run hospitals or the state contracting the doctors or the state uh, buying, purchasing medicines and all that nonsense. No. If some people don't have the money to buy healthcare, then give them the money and then the problem is solved. The rest will take care of itself. Uh, that, that's not a particularly radical idea. That's more or less the way healthcare works in Switzerland. It's more or less the way it works in the, in the Netherlands. And it's also the way most other parts of the welfare system work. So we also want to make sure that, uh, that everybody can afford bread and, and uh, uh, milk and butter, but we don't therefore nationalize the supermarkets. We don't nationalize Tesco and, and Sainsbury's. We don't integrate them into a national grocery service. No, we just uh, make sure that, that people have some income replacement, they have uh, income support tax credits and, and all that kind of stuff, and, and that uh, is enough. That's, that's a minimally invasive way of solving that problem. Now about the idea that uh, the NHS was somehow the envy of, of the world. Uh, it's interesting that NHS fans use all kinds of rhetorical tricks in order to sustain that self-delusion. Uh, the most common trick that they use is that they set the bar ridiculously low. They evaluate the NHS by, by the most absurdly unambitious low benchmarks. So you probably know uh, Harry Leslie Smith, the guy who became a star at the Labour Party conference because he talked about how bad healthcare was before the NHS. Well, yeah, I suppose if you compare modern medicine to the way medicine worked in the 1930s, then you're going to get that result. I suppose in that comparison, the NHS looks pretty good. Uh, if you compare it to a time when medical technology was much more primitive and the country as a whole was a lot poorer or also in one of those speeches uh, around the anniversary that I mentioned. Uh, there was one politician who talked about how she fell ill while traveling through rural Tanzania and how terrible the healthcare there was and how glad she was to be back in, uh, in, in, in Britain and using the NHS. Well, yes, again, if you compare it to an impoverished third world country and then only the rural part of it, then I suppose that that is the result you're going to get. But it's just that we would never accept those kinds of comparisons in any other policy area. Uh, as Nicholas mentioned, my, my actual, my main field is actually poverty. And in poverty debates, you always get the ritual uh, that there's always some poverty activist who talks about how terrible poverty is, talks about food banks and so on. And then you get somebody, usually a, a grumpy old person, who says something like, well, compared to sub-Saharan Africa, nobody in Britain is poor. And everybody hates him for saying that. Or compared to in the 1930s, the Great Depression, nobody, compared to that, nobody's poor. We don't accept those comparisons, and rightfully so, in other areas, because it sets the bar ridiculously low. The, uh, the relevant benchmark is, of course, the health outcomes that you get in other industrialized, high-income countries. So you have to go to compare it to Western Europe, North America, uh, Japan, South Korea, and so on. But once you do that, once you compare medical outcomes, health outcomes here to those of comparable countries, the NHS quickly loses its magic. Because in those comparisons, the NHS is always uh, close to the bottom of the league tables. That is true whether, regardless of whether you look at cancer survival rates or whether you look at uh, stroke survival rates, whether you look at uh, avoidable mortality measures, whether you look at the prevalence of hospital infections. You can almost pick uh, any indicator at random and the NHS will usually be somewhere in, at the bottom of the, of the league table. That is why NHS fans hate those kinds of comparisons. Whenever you show an NHS admirer a, a, a statistic of that sort, they react like Damien in the horror movie The Omen, in that scene in which Damien's parents try to get him into a church. They, they, they will find any excuse saying, oh, well, you can't compare those figures, they're, they're biased, they're flawed, they're useless, they, they don't tell you anything. But interestingly, there's one exception to this. There's NHS admirers will, will 
quickly dismiss any kind of international comparison, saying international comparisons are totally useless. But it's one type of, uh, one comparison, one study, which they wholeheartedly <coughs> endorse. And that's the Commonwealth Fund study. As soon as the Commonwealth Fund study comes up, they immediately throw all their concerns that they usually have about those comparisons out of the window. When it's the Commonwealth Fund study, then international comparisons are perfectly valid, perfectly accurate, and should be taken exactly at face value. Why? Well, you've guessed it, because that is the one study which tells them what they want to hear. That is the one study in which the NHS comes out as number one. That is why that was all over the media, the definitive proof. NHS, best system in the world. Commonwealth Fund study says so. Uh, only a, 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 an ideologue would deny it. Well, um, let me say just two things about the Commonwealth Fund study. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with that study. It's a useful addition. But <coughs> there's, there's a couple of things that people should probably be, be aware of when they uh, refer to it. The first one is, in that study, outcomes are just one relatively insignificant category. Most of it is about inputs and procedures. But if you look at that outcome category in itself, in that category, the NHS is once again at the close to the bottom uh, of the league tables. So even their preferred study says the same thing. On outcomes, the NHS is simply one of the worst systems in the developed world. And secondly, if you look at the Commonwealth Fund study over time, uh, previous, there have been five or six editions of that. Uh, you will see that it doesn't actually consistently rank one type of model uh, better than, than the others. In some of the previous years, it was actually some of the more market-oriented systems that came on top. So in the one just before the current one, the Dutch system came out number one. In one of the previous ones, the German system came out number one. Strangely, in those years, nobody talked about the Commonwealth Fund study. Nobody uh, in those years said, oh, and look, here's the definitive proof. We have to introduce a market-oriented system because the Commonwealth Fund study says so. So, uh, again, this study only comes, comes up when it is convenient. Now, that leads us to the question of the alternative. Um, so uh, talking about abolishing something is is uh, not good enough in its own right. You have to have some idea, of course, what should come in its stead. And I think it's safe to say that the the systems that do well across a variety of indicators and a variety of sources, a variety of studies, tend to be pluralistic systems. So in particular, the Swiss system usually always uh, ranks very highly, and the Dutch system. These are pluralistic systems in the sense that they have a good balance of uh, different institutions. You get lots of institutional variety in those systems. You get a balance between public and private providers, uh, a balance between for-profit and not-for-profit providers, balance between uh, integrated and specialized, small scale, large scale, and so on. So these are systems which offer genuine plurality. Their choice doesn't just mean that you choose between three providers that are all doing the same thing, that are all just clones of one another. Two, yeah, uh, uh, but you get a choice between providers that really do things differently because they are different institutions. They are um, different types of organizations. And in those systems you have competition and it is a level playing field, that competition, because provider payments are always risk adjusted. What that means is simply that you make cherry picking of healthy patients pointless. There's no point in going uh, only for people in their 20s with gym membership because the fact that somebody with complex uh, chronic conditions is, uh, is more expensive to treat, that would be reflected in the, uh, the provider payment structure. So from, even from, uh, from a purely profit maximizing perspective, there's no reason to discriminate against people who are not in, in good health. So that's how you create level playing field competition. 
And one of the best things about those systems is that since providers and, and insurers are in competition with one another, and since they depend on the choices that patients make, they are directly accountable to their patients, not to politicians. That is the main difference, and that is what this motion actually is really about. It's about whether you want a system that, uh, where providers are accountable to you as individual patients, or maybe as a, as a group patients, or whether you want a system in which that uh, accountability is all channeled through the political process, where, they <coughs> are, where providers are accountable to politicians and bureaucrats. Because uh, the problem with, uh, with that is, yes, political accountability, it is an accountability of sorts. You can kick out the government uh, every five years if you think they're especially bad at managing the NHS. But that's a very, very roundabout, very indirect form of accountability. Uh, and and I, I don't actually want to wait until politicians get it and get things right and, and respond. Uh, to, to demands. If I'm not happy with the way a restaurant is, is run, if I'm not happy with the food in a restaurant, or if I'm not happy with a, um, a mobile phone company, I don't set up a national restaurant action party or a national mobile phone action party. I just choose a different provider. I'd like to have that sort of choice and accountability in healthcare as well. 